Chapter 28 Decision Resolve, and thou art free. Longfellow The heaviest charged words in our language are those briefest ones, yes and no. One stands for the surrender of the will, the other for denial, one stands for gratification, the other for character. A stout no means a stout character, the ready yes a weak one, gild it as we may. T. T. Munger. The world is a market where everything is marked at a set price, and whatever we buy with our time, labor, or ingenuity, whether riches, ease, fame, integrity, or knowledge, we must stand by our decision, and not like children, when we have purchased one thing, repine that we do not possess another we did not buy. Matthews. A man must master his undertaking and not let it master him. He must have the power to decide instantly on which side he is going to make his mistakes. P. D. Armour. When Rome was besieged by the Gauls in the time of the Republic, the Romans were so hard pressed that they consented to purchase immunity with gold. They were in the act of weighing it, a legend tells us, when Camillus appeared on the scene, threw his sword into the scales in place of the ransom, and declared that the Romans should not purchase peace, but would win it with the sword. This act of daring and prompt decision so roused the Romans that they triumphantly swept from the sacred soil the enemy of their peace. In an emergency, the arrival of a prompt, decided, positive man, who will do something, although it may be wrong, changes the face of everything. Such a man comes upon the scene like a refreshing breeze blown down from the mountain top. He is a tonic to the hesitating, bewildered crowd. When Antiochus Epiphanes invaded Egypt, which was then under the protection of Rome, the Romans sent an ambassador who met Antiochus near Alexandria and commanded him to withdraw. The invader gave an evasive reply. The brave Roman swept a circle around the king with his sword, and forbade his crossing the line until he had given his answer. By the prompt decision of the intrepid ambassador the invader was led to withdraw, and war was prevented. The prompt decision of the Romans won them many a battle, and made them masters of the world. All the great achievements in the history of the world are the results of quick and steadfast decision. Men who have left their mark upon their century have been men of great and prompt decision. An undecided man, a man who is ever balancing between two opinions, forever debating which of two courses he will pursue, proclaims by his indecision that he cannot control himself, that he was meant to be possessed by others, he is not a man, only a satellite. The decided man, the prompt man, does not wait for favorable circumstances, he does not submit to events, events must submit to him. The vacillating man is ever at the mercy of the opinion of the man who talked with him last. He may see the right, but he drifts toward the wrong. If he decides upon a course he only follows it until somebody opposes it. When Julius Caesar came to the rub icon, which formed the boundary of Italia, the sacred and inviolable, even his great decision wavered at the thought of invading a territory which no general was allowed to enter without the permission of the Senate. But his alternative was destroy myself, or destroy my country, and his intrepid mind did not waver long. The die is cast, he said, as he dashed into the stream at the head of his legions. The whole history of the world was changed by that moment's decision. The man who said, I came, I saw, I conquered, could not hesitate long. He, like Napoleon, had the power to choose one course, and sacrifice every conflicting plan on the instant. When he landed with his troops in Britain, the inhabitants resolved never to surrender. Caesar's quick mind saw that he must commit his soldiers to victory or death. In order to cut off all hope of retreat, he burned all the ships which had borne them to the shores of Britain. There was no hope of return, it was victory or death. This action was the key to the character and triumphs of this great warrior. Satan's sublime decision in Paradise Lost, after his hopeless banishment from heaven, excites a feeling akin to admiration. After a few moments of terrible suspense he resumes his invincible spirit and expresses that sublime line, what matter where, if I be still the same. That power to decide instantly the best course to pursue, and to sacrifice every opposing motive, and, when once sacrificed, 
to silence them forever and not allow them continually to plead their claims and distract us from our single decided course, is one of the most potent forces in winning success. To hesitate is sometimes to be lost. In fact, the man who is forever twisting and turning, backing and filling, hesitating and dawdling, shuffling and parleying, weighing and balancing, splitting hairs over non-essentials, listening to every new motive which presents itself, will never accomplish anything. There is not positiveness enough in him, negativeness never accomplishes anything. The negative man creates no confidence, he only invites distrust. But the positive man, the decided man, is a power in the world, and stands for something. You can measure him, gauge him. You can estimate the work that his energy will accomplish. It is related of Alexander the Great that, when asked how it was that he had conquered the world, he replied, by not wavering. When the packet ship Stephen Whitney struck, at midnight, on an Irish cliff, and clung for a few moments to the cliff, all the passengers who leaped instantly upon the rock were saved. The positive step landed them in safety. Those who lingered were swept off by the returning wave, and engulfed forever. The vacillating man is never a prompt man, and without promptness no success is possible. Great opportunities not only come seldom into the most fortunate life, but also are often quickly gone. A man without decision, says John Foster, can never be said to belong to himself, since if he dared to assert that he did, the puny force of some cause, about as powerful as a spider, may make a seizure of the unhappy boaster the very next minute, and contemptuously exhibit the futility of the determination by which he was to have proved the independence of his understanding and will. He belongs to whatever can make capture of him, and one thing after another vindicates its right to him by arresting him while he is trying to go on, as twigs and chips floating near the edge of a river are intercepted by every weed and whirled into every little eddy. The decided man not only has the advantage of the time saved from dilly-dallying and procrastination, but he also saves the energy and vital force which is wasted by the perplexed man who takes up every argument on one side and then on the other, and weighs them until the two sides hang in equipoise, with no prepondering motive to enable him to decide. He is in stable equilibrium, and so does not move at all of his own volition, but moves very easily at the slightest volition of another. Yet there is not a man living who might not be a prompt and decided man if he would only learn always to act quickly. The punctual man, the decided man, can do twice as much as the undecided and dawdling man who never quite knows what he wants. Prompt decision saved Napoleon and Grant and their armies many a time when delay would have been fatal. Napoleon used to say that although a battle might last an entire day, yet it generally turned upon a few critical minutes, in which the fate of the engagement was decided. His will, which subdued nearly the whole of Europe, was as prompt and decisive in the minutest detail of command as in the greatest battle. Decision of purpose and promptness of action enabled him to astonish the world with his marvellous successes. He seemed to be everywhere at once. What he could accomplish in a day surprised all who knew him. He seemed to electrify everybody about him. His invincible energy thrilled the whole army. He could rouse to immediate and enthusiastic action the dullest troops, and inspire with courage the most stupid men. The IFS and butts, he said, are at present out of season, and above all it must be done with speed. He would sit up all night if necessary, after riding thirty or forty leagues, to attend to correspondence, dispatches and details. What a lesson to dawdling, shiftless, Half-hearted men. The doubt of Charles V, says Motley, changed the destinies of the civilized world. So powerful were President Washington's views in determining the actions of the people, that when Congress adjourned, Jefferson wrote to Monroe at Paris, you will see by their proceedings the truth of what I always told you, namely, that one man outweighs them all in influence, who supports his judgment against their own and that of their representatives. Republicanism resigns the vessel to the pilot. There is no vocation or occupation which does not present many difficulties, at times almost overwhelming, 
and the young man who allows himself to waver every time he comes to a hard place in life will not succeed. Without decision there can be no concentration, and, to succeed, a man must concentrate. The undecided man cannot bring himself to a focus. He dissipates his energy, scatters his forces, and executes nothing. He cannot hold to one thing long enough to bring success out of it. One vocation or occupation presents its rosy side to him, he feels sure it is the thing he wants to do, and, full of enthusiasm, adopts it as his life's work. But in a few days the thorns begin to appear, his enthusiasm evaporates, and he wonders why he is so foolish as to think himself fitted for that vocation. The one which his friend adopted is much better suited to him, he drops his own and adopts the other. So he vacillates through life, captured by any new occupation which happens to appeal to him as the most desirable at the time, never using his judgment or common sense, but governed by his impressions and his feelings at the moment. Such people are never led by principle. You never know where to find them, they are here today and there tomorrow, doing this thing and that thing, throwing away all the skill they had acquired in mastering the drudgery of the last occupation. In fact, they never go far enough in anything to get beyond the drudgery stage to the remunerative and agreeable stage, the skillful stage. They spend their lives at the beginning of occupations, which are always most agreeable. These people rarely reach the stage of competency, comfort, and contentment. There is a legend of a powerful genius who promised a lovely maiden a gift of rare value if she would go through a field of corn, and, without pausing, going backward, or wandering hither and thither, select the largest and ripest ear. The value of the gift was to be in proportion to the size and perfection of the ear. She passed by many magnificent ones, but was so eager to get the largest and most perfect that she kept on without plucking any until the ears she passed were successively smaller and smaller and more stunted. Finally they became so small that she was ashamed to select one of them, and, not being allowed to go backward, she came out on the other side without any. Alexander, his heart throbbing with a great purpose, conquers the world, Hannibal, impelled by his hatred to the Romans, even crosses the Alps to compass his design. While other men are bemoaning difficulties and shrinking from dangers and obstacles, and preparing expedients, the great soul, without fuss or noise, takes the step, and lo, the mountain has been leveled and the way lies open. Learn, then, to will strongly and decisively, thus fix your floating life and leave it no longer to be carried hither and thither, like a withered leaf, by every wind that blows. An undecided man is like the turnstile at a fair, which is in everybody's way but stops no one. The secret of the whole matter was, replied Amos Lawrence, we had formed the habit of prompt acting, thus taking the top of the tide, while the habit of some others was to delay till about half tide, thus getting on the flats. Most of the young men and women who are lost in our cities are ruined because of their inability to say no to the thousand allurements and temptations which appeal to their weak passions. If they would only show a little decision at first, one emphatic no might silence their solicitors forever. But they are weak, they are afraid of offending, they don't like to say no, and thus they throw down the gauntlet and are soon on the broad road to ruin. A little resolution early in life will soon conquer the right to mind one's own business. An old legend says that a fool and a wise man were journeying together, and came to a point where two ways opened before them, one broad and beautiful, the other narrow and rough. The fool desired to take the pleasant way, the wise man knew that the difficult one was the shortest and safest, and so declared. But at last the urgency of the fool prevailed, they took the more inviting path, and were soon met by robbers, who seized their goods and made them captives. A little later both they and their captors were arrested by officers of the law and taken before the judge. Then the wise man pleaded that the fool was to blame because he desired to take the wrong way. The fool pleaded that he was only a fool, and no sensible man should have heeded his counsel. The judge punished them both equally. If sinners entice thee, consent thou not. There is no habit that so grows on the soul as irresolution. Before a man knows what he has done, he has gambled his life away, and all because he has never made up his mind what he would do with it. 
and many of the tombstones of those who have failed in life could be read between the lines, he dawdled, behind time, procrastination, listlessness, shiftlessness, nervelessness, always behind. Oh, the wreck strewn along the shores of life just behind success, just this side of happiness, above which the words of warning are flying. Webster said of such an undecided man that he is like the irresolution of the sea at the turn of tide. This man neither advances nor recedes, he simply hovers. Such a man is at the mercy of any chance occurrence that may overtake him. His days are lost lamenting or lost days. He has no power to seize the facts which confront him and compel them to serve him. To indolent, shiftless, listless people life becomes a mere shuffle of expedience. They do not realize that the habit of putting everything off puts off their manhood, their capacity, their success, their contagion infects their whole neighborhood. Scott used to caution youth against the habit of dawdling, which creeps in at every crevice of unoccupied time and often ruins a bright life. Your motto must be, he said, hot age. Do instantly. This is the only way to check the propensity to dawdling. How many hours have been wasted dawdling in bed, turning over and dreading to get up. Many a career has been crippled by it. Burton could not overcome this habit, and, convinced that it would ruin his success, made his servant promise before he went to bed to get him up at just such a time, the servant called, and called, and coaxed, but Burton would beg him to be left a little longer. The servant, knowing that he would lose his shilling if he did not get him up, then dashed cold water into the bed between the sheets, and Burton came up with a bound. When one asked a lazy young fellow what made him lie in bed so long, I am employed, said he, in hearing counsel every morning. Industry advises me to get up, sloth to lie still, and they give me twenty reasons for and against. It is my part, as an impartial judge, to hear all that can be said on both sides, and by the time the cause is over dinner is ready. There is no doubt that, as a rule, Great decision of character is usually accompanied by great constitutional firmness. Men who have been noted for great firmness of character have usually been strong and robust. There is no quality of the mind which does not sympathize with bodily weakness, and especially is this true with the power of decision, which is usually impaired or weakened from physical suffering or any great physical debility. As a rule, it is the strong physical man who carries weight and conviction. Any bodily weakness, or lassitude, or lack of tone and vigor, is, perhaps, first felt in the weakened or debilitated power of decisions. Nothing will give greater confidence, and bring assistance more quickly from the bank or from a friend, than the reputation of promptness. The world knows that the prompt man's bills and notes will be paid on the day, and will trust him. Let it be your first study to teach the world that you are not wood and straw that there is some iron in you. Let men know that what you say you will do, that your decision, once made, is final, no wavering, that, once resolved, you are not to be allured or intimidated. Some minds are so constructed that they are bewildered and dazed whenever a responsibility is thrust upon them, they have a mortal dread of deciding anything. The very effort to come to immediate and unflinching decision starts up all sorts of doubts, difficulties, and fears, and they cannot seem to get light enough to decide nor courage enough to attempt to remove the obstacle. They know that hesitation is fatal to enterprise, fatal to progress, fatal to success. Yet somehow they seem fated with a morbid introspection which ever holds them in suspense. They have just energy enough to weigh motives, but nothing left for the momentum of action. They analyze and analyze, deliberate, weigh, consider, ponder, but never act. How many a man can trace his downfall in life to the failure to seize his opportunity at the favorable moment, when it was within easy grasp, the nick of time, which often does not present itself but once. It was said that Napoleon had an officer under him who understood the tactics of war better than his commander, but he lacked that power of rapid decision and powerful concentration which characterized the greatest military leaders perhaps of the world. There were several generals under Grant who were as well skilled in war tactics, knew the country as well, were better educated, but they lacked that power of decision which made unconditional surrender absolutely imperative wherever he met the foe. 
Grant's decision was like inexorable fate. There was no going behind it, no opening it up for reconsideration. It was his decision which voiced itself in those memorable words in the wilderness, I propose to fight it out on these lines if it takes all summer, and which sent back the words unconditional surrender to General Buckner, who asked him for conditions of capitulation, that gave the first confidence to the North that the rebellion was doomed. At last Lincoln had a general who had the power of decision, and the North breathed easy for the first time. The man who would forge to the front in this competitive age must be a man of prompt and determined decision, like Caesar, he must burn his ships behind him, and make retreat forever impossible. When he draws his sword he must throw the scabbard away, lest in a moment of discouragement and irresolution he be tempted to sheathe it. He must nail his colours to the mast as Nelson did in battle, determined to sink with his ship if he can not conquer. Prompt decision and sublime audacity have carried many a successful man over perilous crises where deliberation would have been ruin. Hawk Age Chapter 29 Observation as a Success Factor Henry Ward Beecher was not so foolish as to think that he could get on without systematic study and a thoroughgoing knowledge of the world of books. When I first went to Brooklyn, he said, men doubted whether I could sustain myself. I replied, give me uninterrupted time till nine o'clock every morning, and I do not care what comes after. He was a hard student during four hours every morning, those who saw him after that imagined that he picked up the material for his sermons on the street. Yet having said so much, it is true that much that was most vital in his preaching he did pick up on the street. Where does Mr. Beecher get his sermons, every ambitious young clergyman in the country was asking, and upon one occasion he answered, I keep my eyes open and ask questions. This is the secret of many a man's success, keeping his eyes open and asking questions. Although Beecher was an omnivorous reader he did not care much for the writings of the theologians, the Christ was his great model, and he knew that he did not search the writings of the Sanhedrin for his sermons, but picked them up as he walked along the banks of the Jordan and over the hills and through the meadows and villages of Galilee. He saw that the strength of this great master's sermons was in their utter simplicity, their naturalness. Beecher's sermons were very simple, healthy, and strong. They pulsated with life, they had the vigour of bright red blood in them, because, like Christ's, they grew out of doors. He got them everywhere from life and nature. He picked them up in the marketplace, on Wall Street, in the stores. He got them from the brakeman, the mechanic, the blacksmith, the day laborer, the newsboy, the train conductor, the clerk, the lawyer, the physician, and the businessman. He did not watch the progress of the great human battle from his study, as many did. He went into the thick of the fight himself. He was in the smoke and din. Where the battle of life raged fiercest, there he was studying its great problems. Now it was the problem of slavery, again the problem of government, or commerce, or education, whatever touched the lives of men. He kept his hand upon the pulse of events. He was in the swim of things. The great, busy, ambitious world was everywhere throbbing for him. When he once got a taste of the power and helpfulness which comes from the study of real life, when he saw how much more forceful and interesting actual life stories were as they were being lived than anything he could get out of any book except the Bible, he was never again satisfied without illustrations fresh from the lives of the people he met every day. Beecher believed a sermon a failure when it does not make a great mass of hearers go away with a new determination to make a little more of themselves, to do their work a little better, to be a little more conscientious, a little more helpful, a little more determined to do their share in the world. This great observer was not only a student of human nature, but of all nature as well. I watched him, many a time, completely absorbed in drinking in the beauties of the marvellous landscape, gathering grandeur and sublimity from the great white mountains, which he loved so well, and where he spent many summers. He always preached on Sunday at the hotel where he stayed, and great crowds came from every direction to hear him. 
There was something in his sermons that appealed to the best in everyone who heard him. They were full of pictures of beautiful landscapes, seascapes, and entrancing sunsets. The clouds, the rain, the sunshine, and the storm were reflected in them. The flowers, the fields, the brooks, the record of creation imprinted in the rocks and the mountains were intermingled with the ferry boats, the steam cars, orphans, calamities, accidents, all sorts of experiences and bits of life. Happiness and sunshine, birds and trees alternated with the direst poverty in the slums, people on sick beds and deathbeds, in hospitals and in funeral processions, life pictures of successes and failures, of the discouraged, the despondent, the cheerful, the optimist and the pessimist, passed in quick succession and stamped themselves on the brains of his eager hearers. Wherever he went, Beecher continued his study of life through observation. Nothing else was half so interesting. To him man was the greatest study in the world. To place the right values upon men, to emphasize the right thing in them, to be able to discriminate between the genuine and the false, to be able to pierce their masks and read the real man or woman behind them, he regarded as one of a clergyman's greatest accomplishments. Like Professor Agassiz, who could see wonders in the scale of a fish or a grain of sand, Beecher had an eye like the glass of a microscope, which reveals marvels of beauty in common things. He could see beauty and harmony where others saw only ugliness and discord, because he read the hidden meaning in things. Like Ruskin, he could see the marvelous philosophy, the divine plan, in the lowliest object. He could feel the divine presence in all created things. An exhaustive observation, says Herbert Spencer, is an element of all great success. There is no position in life where a trained eye cannot be made a great success asset. Let's leave it to Osler, said the physicians at a consultation where a precious life hung by a thread. Then the great Johns Hopkins professor examined the patient. He did not ask questions. His experienced eye drew a conclusion from the slightest evidence. He watched the patient closely, his manner of breathing, the appearance of the eye, everything was a telltale of the patient's condition, which he read as an open book. He saw symptoms which others could not see. He recommended a certain operation, which was performed, and the patient recovered. The majority of those present disagreed with him, but such was their confidence in his power to diagnose a case through symptoms and indications which escaped most physicians, that they were willing to leave the whole decision to him. Professor Osler was called a living X-ray machine, with additional eyes in fingertips so familiar with the anatomy that they could detect a growth or displacement so small that it would escape ordinary notice. The power which in his inner trained faculty of observation is priceless. The education which Beecher got through observation, by keeping his eyes, his ears, and his mind open, meant a great deal more to him and to the world than his college education. He was not a great scholar, he did not stand nearly as high in college as some of his classmates whom he far outstripped in life, but his mind penetrated to the heart of things. Lincoln was another remarkable example of the possibilities of an education through reflection upon what he observed. His mind stopped and questioned, and extracted the meaning of everything that came within its range. Wherever he went, there was a great interrogation point before him. Everything he saw must give up its secret before he would let it go. He had a passion for knowledge, he yearned to know the meaning of things, the philosophy underlying the common, everyday occurrences. Ruskin says, hundreds of people can talk for one who can think, but thousands can think for one who can see. I once travelled abroad with two young men, one of whom was all eyes, nothing seemed to escape him, and the other never saw anything. The day after leaving a city, the latter could scarcely recall anything of interest, while the former had a genius for absorbing knowledge of every kind through the eye. Things so trivial that his companion did not notice them at all, meant a great deal to him. He was a poor student, but he brought home rich treasures from over the sea. The other young man was comparatively rich, and brought home almost nothing of value. While visiting Luther Burbank, the wizard horticulturist, in his famous garden, recently, I was much impressed by his marvellous power of seeing things. 
He has observed the habits of fruits and flowers to such purpose that he has performed miracles in the fields of floriculture and horticulture. Stunted and ugly flowers and fruits, under the eye of this miracle worker, become marvels of beauty. George W. Cortelli was a stenographer not long ago. Many people thought he would remain a stenographer, but he always kept his eyes open. He was after an opportunity. Promotion was always staring him in the face. He was always looking for the next step above him. He was a shrewd observer. But for this power of seeing things quickly, of absorbing knowledge, he would never have advanced. The youth who would get on must keep his eyes open, his ears open, his mind open. He must be quick, alert, ready. I know a young Turk, who has been in this country only a year, yet he speaks our language fluently. He has studied the map of our country. He knows its geography, and a great deal of our history, and much about our resources and opportunities. He said that when he landed in New York it seemed to him that he saw more opportunities in walking every block of our streets than he had ever seen in the whole of Turkey. And he could not understand the lethargy, the lack of ambition, the indifference of our young men to our marvellous possibilities. The efficient man is always growing. He is always accumulating knowledge of every kind. He does not merely look with his eyes. He sees with them. He keeps his ears open. He keeps his mind open to all that is new and fresh and helpful. The majority of people do not see things, they just look at them. The power of keen observation is indicative of a superior mentality, for it is the mind, not the optic nerve, that really sees. Most people are too lazy, mentally, to see things carefully. Close observation is a powerful mental process. The mind is all the time working over the material which the eye brings it, considering, forming opinions, estimating, weighing, balancing, calculating. Careless, indifferent observation does not go back of the eye. If the mind is not focused, the image is not clean-cut, and is not carried with force and distinctness enough to the brain to enable it to get at the truth and draw accurate conclusions. The observing faculty is particularly susceptible to culture, and is capable of becoming a mighty power. Few people realize what a tremendous success and happiness is possible through the medium of the eye. The telegraph, the sewing machine, the telephone, the telescope, the miracles of electricity, in fact, every great invention of the past or present, every triumph of modern labor-saving machinery, every discovery in science and art, is due to the trained power of seeing things. The whole secret of a richly stored mind is alertness, sharp, keen attention, and thoughtfulness. Indifference, apathy, mental lassitude and laziness are fatal to all effective observation. It does not take long to develop a habit of attention that seizes the salient points of things. It is a splendid drill for children to send them out on the street or out of doors anywhere, just for the purpose of finding out how many things they can see in a certain given time, and how closely they can observe them. Just the effort to try to see how much they can remember and bring back is a splendid drill. Children often become passionately fond of this exercise, and it becomes of inestimable value in their lives. Other things equal, it is the keen observer who gets ahead. Go into a place of business with the eye of an eagle. Let nothing escape you. Ask yourself why it is that the proprietor at 50 or 60 years of age is conducting a business which a boy of 18 or 20 ought to be able to handle better. Study his employees, analyze the situation. You will find perhaps that he never knew the value of good manners in clerks. He thought a boy, if honest, would make a good salesman, but, perhaps, by gruff, uncouth manners, he is driving out of the door customers the proprietor is trying to bring in by advertisements. You will see by his show windows, perhaps, before you go into his store, that there is no business in sight, no detection of the wants of possible buyers. If you keep your eyes open, you can, in a little while, find out why this man is not a greater success. You can see that a little more knowledge of human nature would have revolutionized his whole business, multiplied the receipts tenfold in a few years. 
you will see that this man has not studied men. He does not know them. No matter where you go, study the situation. Think why the man does not do better if he is not doing well, why he remains in mediocrity all his life. If he is making a remarkable success, try to find out why. Keep your eyes open, your ears open. Make deductions from what you see and hear. Trace difficulties, look up evidences of success or failure everywhere. It will be one of the greatest factors in your own success. Chapter 30. Self-Help. I learned that no man in God's wide earth is either willing or able to help any other man. Pestalozzi. What I am I have made myself. Humphrey Davy. Be sure, my son, and remember that the best men always make themselves. Patrick Henry. Hereditary bondsmen, know ye not who would be free themselves must strike the blow. Byron. Who waits to have his task marked out, shall die and leave his errand unfulfilled. Lowell. Colonel Crockett makes room for himself, exclaimed a backwards congressman in answer to the exclamation of the White House usher to make room for Colonel Crockett. This remarkable man was not afraid to oppose the head of a great nation. He preferred being right to being president. Though rough, uncultured, and uncouth, Crockett was a man of great courage and determination. Poverty is uncomfortable, as I can testify, said James A. Garfield, but nine times out of ten the best thing that can happen to a young man is to be tossed overboard and compelled to sink or swim for himself. In all my acquaintance I have never known a man to be drowned who was worth the saving. Garfield was the youngest member of the House of Representatives when he entered, but he had not been in his seat sixty days before his ability was recognized and his place conceded. He stepped to the front with the confidence of one who belonged there. He succeeded because all the world in concert could not have kept him in the background, and because when once in the front he played his part with an intrepidity and a commanding ease that were but the outward evidences of the immense reserves of energy on which it was in his power to draw. Take the place and attitude which belong to you, says Emerson, and all men acquiesce. The world must be just. It leaves every man with profound unconcern to set his own rate. A person under the firm persuasion that he can command resources virtually has them, says Livy. Richard Arkwright, the thirteenth child, in a hovel, with no education, no chance, gave his spinning model to the world, and put a scepter in England's right hand such as the Queen never wielded. Solerio, a wandering gypsy tinker, fell deeply in love with the daughter of the painter Col Antonio del Fura, but was told that no one but a painter as good as the father should wed the maiden. Will you give me ten years to learn to paint, and so entitle myself to the hand of your daughter? Consent was given, Col Antonio thinking that he would never be troubled further by the gypsy. About the time that the ten years were to end the king's sister showed Col Antonio a Madonna and child, which the painter extolled in terms of the highest praise. Judge of his surprise on learning that Solerio was the artist. His great determination gained him his bride. Louis Philippe said he was the only sovereign in Europe fit to govern, for he could black his own boots. When asked to name his family coat of arms, a self made president of the United States replied, A pair of shirt sleeves. It is not the men who have inherited most, except it be in nobility of soul and purpose who have risen highest, but rather the men with no start who have won fortunes, and have made adverse circumstances a spur to goad them up the steep mount, where fame's proud temple shines afar. To such men, every possible goal is accessible, an honest ambition has no height that genius or talent may tread, which has not felt the impress of their feet. You may leave your millions to your son, but have you really given him anything? You cannot transfer the discipline, the experience, the power, which the acquisition has given you, you cannot transfer the delight of achieving, the joy felt only in growth, the pride of acquisition, the character which trained habits of accuracy, method, promptness, patience, dispatch, honesty of dealing, politeness of manner have developed. You cannot transfer the skill, sagacity, prudence, foresight, which lie concealed in your wealth. 
It meant a great deal for you, but means nothing to your heir. In climbing to your fortune, you developed the muscle, stamina, and strength which enabled you to maintain your lofty position, to keep your millions intact. You had the power which comes only from experience, and which alone enables you to stand firm on your dizzy height. Your fortune was experienced to you, joy, growth, discipline, and character, to him it will be a temptation, an anxiety, which will probably dwarf him. It was wings to you, it will be a dead weight to him, to you it was education and expansion of your highest powers, to him it may mean inaction, lethargy, indolence, weakness, ignorance. You have taken the priceless spur necessity away from him, the spur which has goaded man to nearly all the great achievements in the history of the world. You thought it a kindness to deprive yourself in order that your son might begin where you left off. You thought to spare him the drudgery, the hardships, the deprivations, the lack of opportunities, the meager education, which you had on the old farm. But you have put a crutch into his hand instead of a staff, you have taken away from him the incentive to self-development, to self-elevation, to self-discipline and self-help, without which no real success, no real happiness, no great character is ever possible. His enthusiasm will evaporate, his energy will be dissipated, his ambition, not being stimulated by the struggle for self-elevation, will gradually die away. If you do everything for your son and fight his battles for him, you will have a weakling on your hands at twenty-one. My life is a wreck, said the dying Cyrus W. Field, my fortune gone, my home dishonored. Oh, I was so unkind to Edward when I thought I was being kind. If I had only had firmness enough to compel my boys to earn their living, then they would have known the meaning of money. His table was covered with medals and certificates of honor from many nations, in recognition of his great work for civilization in mooring two continents side by side in thought, of the fame he had won and could never lose. But grief shook the sands of life as he thought only of the son who had brought disgrace upon a name before unsullied, the wounds were sharper than those of a serpent's tooth. During the great financial crisis of 1857 Maria Mitchell, who was visiting England, asked an English lady what became of daughters when no property was left them. They live on their brothers, was the reply. But what becomes of the American daughters, asked the English lady, when there is no money left? They earn it, was Miss Mitchell's reply. Men who have been bolstered up all their lives are seldom good for anything in a crisis. When misfortune comes, they look around for somebody to lean upon. It the prop is not there, down they go. Once down, they are as helpless as capsized turtles, or unhorsed men in armor. Many a frontier boy has succeeded beyond all his expectations simply because all props were early knocked out from under him and he was obliged to stand upon his own feet. A man's best friends are his ten fingers, said Robert Collier, who brought his wife to America in the steerage. There is no manhood mill which takes in boys and turns out men. What you call no chance may be your only chance. Don't wait for your place to be made for you, make it yourself. Don't wait for somebody to give you a lift, lift yourself. Henry Ward Beecher did not wait for a call to a big church with a large salary. He accepted the first pastorate offered him, in a little town near Cincinnati. He became literally the light of the church, for he trimmed the lamps, kindled the fires, swept the rooms, and rang the bell. His salary was only about $200 a year, but he knew that a fine church and great salary can not make a great man. It was work and opportunity that he wanted. He felt that if there were anything in him work would bring it out. When Beethoven was examining the work of Moscheles, he found written at the end, Finus, with God's help. He wrote under it, Man, help yourself. A young man stood listlessly watching some anglers on a bridge. He was poor and dejected. At length, approaching a basket filled with fish, he sighed, If now I had these I would be happy. I could sell them and buy food and lodgings. I will give you just as many and just as good said the owner, who chanced to overhear his words, if you will do me a trifling favor. And what is that? asked the other. Only to tend this line till I come back, I wish to go on a short errand. 
The proposal was gladly accepted. The old man was gone so long that the young man began to get impatient. Meanwhile the fish snapped greedily at the hook, and he lost all his depression in the excitement of pulling them in. When the owner returned he had caught a large number. Counting out from them as many as were in the basket, and presenting them to the youth, the old fisherman said, I fulfill my promise from the fish you have caught, to teach you whenever you see others earning what you need to waste no time in foolish wishing, but cast a line for yourself. A white squall caught a party of tourists on a lake in Scotland, and threatened to capsize the boat. When it seemed that the crisis had really come, the largest and strongest man in the party, in a state of intense fear, said, let us pray. No, no, my man, shouted the bluff old boatman, let the little man pray. You take an oar. The grandest fortunes ever accumulated or possessed on earth were another fruit of endeavor that had no capital to begin with save energy, intellect, and the will. From Croesus down to Rockefeller the story is the same, not only in the getting of wealth, but also in the acquirement of eminence, those men have won most who relied most upon themselves. The male inhabitants in the township of Lofordham, in the county of Hatework, says a printer's squib, found themselves laboring under great inconvenience for want of an easily travelled road between poverty and independence. They therefore petitioned the powers that be to levy a tax upon the property of the entire county for the purpose of laying out a macadamized highway, broad and smooth, and all the way downhill to the latter place. Everyone is the artificer of his own fortune, says Sal Lust. Man is not merely the architect of his own fate, but he must lay the bricks himself. Bayard Taylor, at 23, wrote, I will become the sculptor of my own mind statue. His biography shows how often the chisel and hammer were in his hands to shape himself into his ideal. Labor is the only legal tender in the world to true success. The gods sell everything for that, nothing without it. You will never find success marked down. The door to the temple of success is never left open. Everyone who enters makes his own door, which closes behind him to all others. Circumstances have rarely favored great men. They have fought their way to triumph over the road of difficulty and through all sorts of opposition. A lowly beginning and a humble origin are no bar to a great career. The farmer's boys fill many of the greatest places in legislatures, in business, at the bar, in pulpits, in Congress, today. Boys of lowly origin have made many of the greatest discoveries, are presidents of our banks, of our colleges, of our universities. Our poor boys and girls have written many of our greatest books, and have filled the highest places as teachers and journalists. Ask almost any great man in our large cities where he was born, and he will tell you it was on a farm or in a small country village. Nearly all of the great capitalists of the city came from the country. Isaac Rich, the founder of Boston University, left Cape Cod for Boston to make his way with a capital of only four dollars. Like Horace Greeley, he could find no opening for a boy, but what of that? He made an opening. He found a board, and made it into an oyster stand on the street corner. He borrowed a wheelbarrow, and went three miles to an oyster smack, bought three bushels of oysters, and wheeled them to his stand. Soon his little savings amounted to $130, and then he bought a horse and cart. Self-help has accomplished about all the great things of the world. How many young men falter, faint, and dally with their purpose because they have no capital to start with, and wait and wait for some good luck to give them a lift. But success is the child of drudgery and perseverance. It cannot be coaxed or bribed, pay the price and it is yours. Where is the boy today who has less chance to rise in the world than Ellie Huberit, apprentice to a blacksmith, in whose shop he had to work at the forge all the daylight, and often by candlelight? Yet, he managed, by studying with a book before him at his meals, carrying it in his pocket that he might utilize every spare moment, and studying at night and holidays, to pick up an excellent education in the odds and ends of time which most boys throw away. While the rich boy and the idler were yawning and stretching and getting their eyes open, young Burritt had seized the opportunity and improved it.
At 30 years of age he was master of every important language in Europe and was studying those of Asia. What chance had such a boy for distinction? Probably not a single youth will read this book who has not a better opportunity for success. Yet he had a thirst for knowledge and a desire for self-improvement, which overcame every obstacle in his pathway. If the youth of America who are struggling against cruel circumstances to do something and be somebody in the world could only understand that 90% of what is called genius is merely the result of persistent, determined industry, in most cases of downright hard work, that it is the slavery to a single idea which has given to many a mediocre talent the reputation of being a genius, they would be inspired with new hope. It is interesting to note that the men who talk most about genius are the men who like to work the least. The lazier the man, the more he will have to say about great things being done by genius. The greatest geniuses have been the greatest workers. Sheridan was considered a genius, but it was found that the brilliance and offhand sayings with which he used to dazzle the House of Commons were elaborated, polished and repolished, and put down in his memorandum book ready for any emergency. Genius has been well defined as the infinite capacity for taking pains. If men who have done great things could only reveal to the struggling youth of today how much of their reputations was due to downright hard digging and plodding, what an uplift of inspiration and encouragement they would give. How often I have wished that the discouraged, struggling youth could know of the heartaches, the headaches, the nerve aches, the disheartening trials, the discouraged hours, the fears and despair involved in works which have gained the admiration of the world, but which have taxed the utmost powers of their authors. You can read in a few minutes or a few hours a poem or a book with only pleasure and delight, but the days and months of weary plodding over details and dreary drudgery often required to produce it would stagger belief. The greatest works in literature have been elaborated and elaborated, line by line, paragraph by paragraph, often rewritten a dozen times. The drudgery which literary men have put into the productions which have stood the test of time is almost incredible. Lucretius worked nearly a lifetime on one poem. It completely absorbed his life. It is said that Bryant rewrote Thanatopsis a hundred times, and even then was not satisfied with it. John Foster would sometimes linger a week over a single sentence. He would hack, split, prune, pull up by the roots, or practice any other severity on whatever he wrote, till it gained his consent to exist. Chalmers was once asked what Foster was about in London. Hard at it, he replied, at the rate of a line a week. Even Lord Bacon, one of the greatest geniuses that ever lived, at his death left large numbers of manuscripts filled with sudden thoughts set down for use. Hume toiled thirteen hours a day on his history of England. Lord Eldon astonished the world with his great legal learning, but when he was a student too poor to buy books, he had actually borrowed and copied many hundreds of pages of large law books. Matthew Hale for years studied law 16 hours a day. Speaking of Fox, someone declared that he wrote drop by drop. Rousseau says of the labor involved in his smooth and lively style, my manuscripts, blotted, scratched, interlined, and scarcely legible, attest the trouble they cost me. There is not one of them which I have not been obliged to transcribe four or five times before it went to press. Some of my periods I have turned or returned in my head for five or six nights before they were fit to be put to paper. Beethoven probably surpassed all other musicians in his painstaking fidelity and persistent application. There is scarcely a bar in his music that was not written and rewritten at least a dozen times. His favorite maxim was, the barriers are not yet erected which can say to aspiring talent and industry thus far and no further. Gibbon wrote his autobiography nine times, and was in his study every morning, summer and winter, at six o'clock, and yet youth who waste their evenings wonder at the genius which can produce the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, upon which Gibbon worked twenty years. Even Plato, one of the greatest writers that ever lived, wrote the first sentence in his Republic nine different ways before he was satisfied with it. Burke wrote the conclusion of his speech at the trial of Hastings sixteen times, and Butler his famous analogy twenty times. It took Vigil seven years to write his Georgics, and twelve years to write the Aeneid.
He was so displeased with the latter that he attempted to rise from his deathbed to commit it to the flames. Haydn was very poor, his father was a coachman and he, friendless and lonely, married a servant girl. He was sent away from home to act as errand boy for a music teacher. He absorbed a great deal of information, but he had a hard life of persecution until he became a barber in Vienna. Here he blacked boots for an influential man, who became a friend to him. In 1798 this poor boy's oratorio, The Creation, came upon the musical world like the rising of a new sun which never set. He was courted by princes and dined with kings and queens, his reputation was made, there was no more barbering, no more poverty. But of his 800 compositions, the creation eclipsed them all. He died while Napoleon's guns were bombarding Vienna, some of the shot falling in his garden. When a man like Lord Kavanagh, without arms or legs, manages to put himself into Parliament, when a man like Francis Joseph Campbell, a blind man, becomes a distinguished mathematician, a musician, and a great philanthropist, we get a hint as to what it means to make the most possible out of ourselves and our opportunities. Perhaps 99 of a hundred under such unfortunate circumstances would be content to remain helpless objects of charity for life. If it is your call to acquire money power instead of brain power, to acquire business power instead of professional power, double your talent just the same, no matter what it may be. A glover's apprentice of Glasgow, Scotland, who was too poor to afford even a candle or a fire, and who studied by the light of the shop windows in the streets, and when the shops were closed climbed the lamppost, holding his book in one hand, and clinging to the lamppost with the other, this poor boy, with less chance than almost any boy in America, became the most eminent scholar of Scotland. Francis Pockman, half-blind, became one of America's greatest historians in spite of everything, because he made himself such. Personal value is a coin of one's own minting, one is taken at the worth he has put into himself. Franklin was but a poor printer's boy, whose highest luxury at one time was only a penny roll, eaten in the streets of Philadelphia. Michael Faraday was a poor boy, son of a blacksmith, who apprenticed him at the age of 13 to a bookbinder in London. Michael laid the foundations of his future greatness by making himself familiar with the contents of the books he bound. He remained at night, after others had gone, to read and study the precious volumes. Lord Tenterden was proud to point out to his son the shop where he had shaved for a penny. A French doctor once taunted Fleshier, Bishop of Nisams, who had been a tallow chandler in his youth, with the meanness of his origin, to which he replied, if you had been born in the same condition that I was, you would still have been but a maker of candles. Edwin Chadwick in his report to the British Parliament, stated that children, working on half-time, that is, studying three hours a day and working the rest of their time out of doors, really made the greatest intellectual progress during the year. Businessmen have often accomplished wonders during their busiest lives by simply devoting one, two, three, or four hours daily to study or other literary work. James Watt received only the rudiments of an education at school, for his attendance was irregular on account of delicate health. He more than made up for all deficiencies, however, by the diligence with which he pursued his studies at home. Alexander V was a beggar, he was born mud, and died marble. William Herschel, placed at the age of fourteen as a musician in the band of the Hanoverian Guards, devoted all his leisure to philosophical studies. He acquired a large fund of general knowledge, and in astronomy, a science in which he was wholly self-instructed, his discoveries entitle him to rank with the greatest astronomers of all time. George Washington was the son of a widow, born under the roof of a Westmoreland farmer, almost from infancy his lot had been that of an orphan. No academy had welcomed him to its shade, no college crowned him with its honours, to read, to write, to cipher these had been his degrees in knowledge. Shakespeare learned little more than reading and writing at school, but by self-culture he made himself the great master among literary men. Burns, too, enjoyed few advantages of education, and his youth was passed in almost abject poverty. James Ferguson, 
the son of a half-starved peasant, learned to read by listening to the recitations of one of his elder brothers. While a mere boy he discovered several mechanical principles, made models of mills and spinning wheels, and by means of beads on strings worked out an excellent map of the heavens. Ferguson made remarkable things with a common penknife. How many great men have mounted the hill of knowledge by out-of-the-way paths? Gifford worked his intricate problems with a shoemaker's awl on a bit of leather. Rittenhouse first calculated eclipses on his plough handle. Columbus, while leading the life of a sailor, managed to become the most accomplished geographer and astronomer of his time. When Peter the Great, a boy of 17, became the absolute ruler of Russia his subjects were little better than savages, and in himself even the passions and propensities of barbarism were so strong that they were frequently exhibited during his whole career. But he determined to transform himself and the Russians into civilized people. He instituted reforms with great energy, and at the age of 26 started on a visit to the other countries of Europe for the purpose of learning about their arts and institutions. At Saddam, Holland, he was so impressed with the sights of the Great East India Dockyard that he apprenticed himself to a shipbuilder, and helped to build the St. Peter, which he promptly purchased. Continuing his travels, after he had learned his trade, he worked in England in paper mills, sawmills, rope yards, watchmakers' shops, and other manufactories, doing the work and receiving the treatment of a common laborer. While traveling, his constant habit was to obtain as much information as he could beforehand with regard to every place he was to visit, and he would demand, let me see all. When setting out on his investigations, on such occasions, he carried his tablets in his hand and whatever he deemed worthy of remembrance was carefully noted down. He would often leave his carriage if he saw the country people at work by the wayside as he passed along, and not only enter into conversation with them on agricultural affairs, but also accompany them to their homes, examine their furniture, and take drawings of their implements of husbandry. Thus he obtained much minute and correct knowledge, which he would scarcely have acquired by other means, and which he afterward turned to admirable account in the improvement of his own country. The ancients said, Know thyself, the twentieth century says, Help thyself. Self-culture gives a second birth to the soul. A liberal education is a true regeneration. When a man is once liberally educated, he will generally remain a man, not shrink to a mannequin, nor dwindle to a brute. But if he is not properly educated, if he has merely been crammed and stuffed through college, if he has merely a broken down memory from trying to hold crammed facts enough to pass the examination, he will continue to shrink, shrivel, and dwindle, often below his original proportions for he will lose both his confidence and self-respect, as his crammed facts, which never became a part of himself, evaporate from his distended memory. Every bit of education or culture is of great advantage in the struggle for existence. The microscope does not create anything new, but it reveals marvels. To educate the eye adds to its magnifying power until it sees beauty where before it saw only ugliness. It reveals a world we never suspected, and finds the greatest beauty even in the commonest things. The eye of an Agassiz could see worlds of which the uneducated eye never dreamed. The cultured hand can do a thousand things the uneducated hand can not do. It becomes graceful, steady of nerve, strong, skillful, indeed it almost seems to think, so animated is it with intelligence. The cultured will can seize, grasp, and hold the possessor, with irresistible power and nerve, to almost superhuman effort. The educated touch can almost perform miracles. The educated taste can achieve wonders almost past belief. What a contrast between the cultured, logical, profound, masterly reason of a Gladstone and that of the hot carrier who has never developed or educated his reason beyond what is necessary to enable him to mix mortar and carry brick. Be careful to avoid that over-intellectual culture which is purchased at the expense of moral vigor. An observant professor of one of our colleges has remarked that the mind may be so rounded and polished by education, and so well balanced, as not to be energetic in any one faculty. In other men not thus trained, the sense of deficiency and of the sharp, jagged corners of their knowledge leads to efforts to fill up the chasms, 
rendering them at last far better educated men than the polished, easygoing graduate who has just knowledge enough to prevent consciousness of his ignorance. While all the faculties of the mind should be cultivated, it is yet desirable that it should have two or three rough-hewn features of massive strength. Young men are too apt to forget the great end of life, which is to be and do, not to read and brood over what other men have been and done. I repeat that my object is not to give him knowledge, but to teach him how to acquire it at need, said Rousseau. All learning is self-teaching. It is upon the working of the pupil's own mind that his progress in knowledge depends. The great business of the master is to teach the pupil to teach himself. Thinking, not growth, makes manhood, says Isaac Taylor. Accustom yourself, therefore, to thinking. Set yourself to understand whatever you see or read. To join thinking with reading is one of the first maxims, and one of the easiest operations. How few think justly of the thinking few, how many never think who think they do.